My name is John Whitman. I'm a fourth degree black belt in Krav Maga. I've been training for about 18 years. Uh, I'm the president of Krav Maga Alliance, and I also own a Krav Maga facility uh, in Los Angeles called Focus Self-Defense and Fitness. It was 1991. Uh, I had not in that year, but previous to that, I'd been in some pretty rough experiences. I'd had a gun put to my head. Uh, I'd been in some fights, and I wanted answers. I wanted to know how to defend myself in some bad situations. I'd been in fights before, typical fights, but I'd been in a couple that were pretty bad, including one robbery where a gun was put to my head. And uh, I was looking around for what I considered to be a practical self-defense system, one that answered some of the questions I had based on my experiences. I looked around at certain other things. Some were, in my opinion, bad. Some were mediocre. The only system, for me at least, that answered all the questions I had about realistic training was Krav Maga. Uh, obviously, the more you train, the better you will get. But Krav Maga as a system is designed for short-term training. The assumption built into Krav Maga is that people won't have time to become career martial artists. You can actually master the basis of Krav Maga and certainly get the approach and the attitude in eight to 12 weeks. Uh, assuming you're training a couple times a week. Now, to understand more technique and to get into higher level and higher risk training, you have to be with it longer. But you'll learn the basics against the average street attack in a few months. It takes you from zero to 60 faster than any other system I've ever seen. Or you could put it this way, that it brings you to a high level of proficiency quickly. That's what Krav Maga does. Good. Now slowly, please. Good. One more time. Good. All right, let's discuss what's going on. James is the attacker. His hands are on Nikki's throat. By the time she realizes she's being attacked at all, this is the danger. She has to address this immediate danger of her windpipe being crushed by his thumbs. Instinctively, her hands are going to fly up to where they feel pain. So her hands are going to want to do something similar to our technique. They'll fly up where they feel the pain. Instead of grabbing, though, Nikki, you make your technique as though you're grabbing an improper technique. Instead of grabbing, which is a little bit closer to instinct, we're going to modify that, and her hands are going to become like hooks. Hold your hands up and out a little bit. Her thumb's part of the hook. Her, her hands are bent, and she's going to reach in deep, not just with her fingertips, all the way up to her wrists and close to his thumbs. Immediately, she's plucking out along her shoulders and then down a little bit, trapping his hands. Do that, just that motion slowly, just slow motion, the pluck. Her hands are like hooks, the thumb is part of the, good. Do it a few more times. Good, one more time. If you'll notice, relax, hands on the throat. When Nikki goes to pluck, she's gonna get close to his thumbs. She wants this because the closer she gets to his thumbs, the more leverage that she has. Now, the nice thing about the instinct part of her reaction is that she doesn't have to see where his thumbs are. She goes where she feels pain. That's where his thumbs will be. So she reaches in deep and close to his thumbs and plucks out for maximum leverage. The farther, thank you, the farther up James's arm she went, the worse her technique would be. But she's not doing that. She stays close to the thumbs for most leverage. Now, this, make the defense one more time, just the defense. Good. This is a good defense. She wants to hold on to his hands. Notice at the end of her pluck, Nikki is trapping James's hands so he can't get free. Now, he might struggle to get free, but at least for the moment, his hands are trapped and he can't use them. Make the defense and the counterattack. Now we're adding the counterattack. She defends and counters simultaneously. She starts out in a passive or neutral stance. As the attack comes on, she plucks and kicks to the groin at the same time. Her hands are occupied. Her legs are free, she gives a groin kick. From here, she follows up. Her knees, maybe more groin kicks, punches, whatever feels like, her, like it makes sense to her. Go back. 
Watch how, how close together the pluck and the kick are. Got to get just that a few more times. Nice. One last comment. Notice how Nikki is not trying to, to kick James with any certain part of her leg. She swings her whole leg at his groin. If she gets him with her toe, maybe he's a longer person with longer arms, okay. If she gets him with her shin, fine. Her knee, whatever she gets, she gets. But she doesn't have time in the moment to try and gauge her distance as her whole leg goes. Good, now finish up. Good. The last thing to say is to go back and talk about that plucking action one more time. Notice how Nikki is not pausing at all. It is one fluid motion from beginning to end. Good, one more time. Nice. Good, hold on. So now we work on a situation where the attack is the same. It's a choke from the front, but now the defender's being pushed back. The defender has to react to both the threat to the throat and being off balance. The attack and the defense look like this. Again. Good, slowly please. So let's break this down. The attack comes on, and Nikki, don't defend yet. Slow attack and freeze. By the time Nikki realizes she's being attacked at all, she's in this position or something like it. She's off balance. Before she realizes what the nature of the attack is, she's already off balance. So even though she's feeling pressure in her throat, she might feel the need to put her hands up. She's also dealing with being knocked backwards. Her hands are going to fly a little bit. We turn that reaction into our technique. So as she's falling back, Nikki's going to take a small step with one foot and stab the other foot to the, uh, the other hand to the sky. Good. Stab to the sky. Her bicep is right near her ear. From this position, a sharp rotation to break the plane of the attacker's wrist. From here, she drops her elbow down to trap his hands. Then it's an elbow to the face, followed by additional counterattacks, taking control and finishing. Again, make the attack and freeze. Good, from here. Nikki takes a small step back, not a big step. A big step is unrealistic. A big, make a big step. A big step, if you could do it, it might help, but in reality, when you're surprised, you won't pull this off, or you're unlikely to. So we'll come back. We train to take a small step, which is more realistic, and stab our hand to the sky. What you want to think of is bicep near your ear. The bicep goes near the ear, and from here, Nikki makes a very sharp turn right across the plane of James's wrist. Come back. If she were to have her arm farther away from her ear, and she made that same turn, it would be farther up James's arm, and she might succeed, or come back, James, bend your elbows even a little bit. If James makes his arms a little bit stronger, Nikki tries to defend from here, and she's not going to have the same success. But, go back, bicep to the ear. That guarantees she's going to make leverage right at the attacker's wrist. She makes that same sharp turn, and she breaks the hold. It's not relevant to the choke that his hands are near her throat. There's no pressure anymore. Now, she wants to get the hands away from her so they're not bothering her. She drops an elbow down. Other hand comes up to catch. From here, elbow back to the face. Good. Finish. Good. One more time slowly.
Good. Now slowly. Good. One more time. Good. So in this attack, choke from the side, we're following principles that are already familiar to us. Hands are on the throat. Nikki has to address the immediate danger. She uses something based on instinct. Her hands want to fly to her throat where they feel pain. Her hands are going to move. But now we use the outside hand only. The inside hand won't do us much good. Her outside hand is like a hook. Thumb is part of the hook. She makes a pluck explosively. Good. Again. Good. If you watch, just like the other technique, she's reaching farther than she needs to, and then she's ripping down. This time, the motion of her arm is about 45 degrees across her body in a quick motion to pluck near the thumb. Good. Last time. The only thing technically to be aware of is that you don't want to make the pluck and roll your hand away from your body. Do that, make that mistake, roll your hand away from your body. Good. The truth is, you actually get some leverage on the attacker's uh, thumb, but your motion of your body is not as strong. So we make a strong motion of our body. She drags it along her, her chest. Good. That's, again, that's the pluck. Now, as with everything in Krav Maga, simultaneous counterattack. So while she's plucking with the outside hand, inside hand makes a groin strike. Palm faces the target, ripping up and under. Go. Good. Again. Good. From here, immediately after that initial counterattack, ripping upwards with an elbow. There are a couple of options for elbows, but the one we prefer, the one that seems most natural to us, is the groin strike, boom, and an elbow straight up the side. Go. Good. Again, one more time. Good. From your stay, this stay right there. From here, Nikki's going to continue with counterattacks, pop probably hammer fist to the side of the head, catching and finishing with knees. Good. Again, one more time, the whole thing slowly. Good. One quick comment. James, make the attack. Nikki, make the initial defense and counterattack and then freeze. Go ahead, make the elbow. Now, from here, there are several ways you can grab, but what we like to show is catching, make the catch the way you just were. Uh, yeah, right there, freeze. Getting to the, to the near shoulder. This prevents James from trying headbutts, if he's thinking about headbutts. Go back, please. Make the initial defense and counterattack, and then freeze. If Nikki were to reach across to the other shoulder this way, there's some danger as she's transitioning. Go back right into the middle. As she's reaching across, that James headbutts her or drops in for a bear hug. He has some openings. Hopefully, he's hurt too much to take advantage of them, but he has some opportunities. We try and deny him those. So Nikki makes the defense and counterattack, gets to the inside, yeah, and then she finishes from there. Good. Choke from the side. Good, now slow. Good. All right, again. Now, this is choke from behind. Although the technique looks a bit different than choke from the front, it follows the same principles. So the hands are on the throat. James has to address the immediate danger, and his hands want to fly up where they feel pain. So he makes hooks out of his hands. He reaches back as far as he can to make sure he gets the hands, and he plucks down explosively. Good. There's no pause. Again, it's one fluid motion, straight down. Now it's two elbows to his stomach. One more time, please. Good. Notice a couple details. Not yet. As James is making the, the technique, he's tucking his chin, which is fairly instinctive, and he's rounding his back. This gives him balance and exposes the thumbs so he can make the technique. Make just the pluck again, please. 
Now, this isn't enough for us. We have to start changing our position. So as James is making the defense, he's also stepping diagonally back into the side to, to A, get out from in front of the attacker, and B, line the attacker up for his counterattack. One more time, the pluck and the step, please. Good. Now, do me a favor, James. Go to the other side, pluck and step the other direction. Good. Now, from here, go back. Simultaneously, as James is making the pluck, his inside hand is traveling down. He lets it continue to go, and he's making a groin strike as he's making the pluck. Go. Good. Again. Slow motion. Good. The groin strike is usually made palm facing the target, hitting up and under. One more time. Good. From here, James continues with counterattacks. The next most logical may be an elbow, probably to the face, possibly to the midsection, but we prefer going up to the face if we can. Boom. Turning in and finishing. Good. Watch a couple details. Make the initial defense and counterattack, and then freeze. From there. Watch when James turns. If he can, if he can control the situation, he wants to turn inside to the inside shoulder. Counterattacking as he turns, but getting to the inside shoulder. James, come back, please. It's possible, but not preferred, make the initial defense and counterattack, for James to turn to the outside and go to the other shoulder. Freeze. The problem with this is that James tends to go, to go across several of, Brian, of the attacker, Brian's, weapons. So what he wants to do is defend and counter, turn to the inside where he's safer and get more, get more immediate control, and then finish. Good. Last comment to make. Make the attack again, please. Slow motion. James's feet. Diagonal step, counterattacks, and watch his inside foot. It steps out a little bit to avoid Brian's feet and legs. Good. One more time. Good, one more time live. Good, choke from behind. So now, we're going to take this idea of choke from behind and add a push to it. So the attack is the same, the initial threat is the same, but just like before, um, when the, we had choke from the front, we added a push, now we had a push from behind. So now Brian attacks James, chokes him, but also shoves him forward. Make the attack live, aggressive defense. Go. Look again. Good. Let's keep going. James, make, when you make the defense, keep your arm closer to your ear longer. Don't worry about giving him an elbow. Keep your arm straight and closer to your ear a little bit longer. Go. Do it. Okay. See? Not, not this. Turn in your place. Keep that bicep wedded to your ear. Turn. And then you can move your arm. Better? Good. Good. Again. Do a couple more. I'm going to tell you out. Good. Again, one more time. Good. Now slowly. Good. One more time slowly. Push. Push. Good. 
All right, so the attack comes on. Just make the attack, push him forward a little bit, and then freeze. Good. Again, by the time James realizes he's being attacked at all, he's in this off-balance position. He has to be able to react and function from here. He's falling forward. His hands might fly out to stop his fall. He makes a small step with one foot, and the opposite hand stabs straight ahead, bicep to the ear. From here, he makes a sharp turn in his place to affect the wrist. Perfect. Now from here, he has to do two things. He has to finish regaining his balance. He steps back. At the same time, he's throwing a counterattack. Good. Catching, finishing with knees. Kicks, whatever seems appropriate. Come back. Again, go uh, to the, the, the fence and stop. Freeze right here. Good. This is our initial motion. From here, you want to make sure that, that when James makes the defense, he affects the wrist. If James were to try and roll backwards toward Brian, he would get stopped. Bicep of the ear, sharp turn in his place. That's what defends the choke. From here, James is going to step back with the, with the inside foot and counterattack. Good, one more time slowly. Good, choke from behind with a push. Headlock from behind, specifically a bar arm. The headlock comes on from behind. If I had time, I would tuck my chin early. Even before the headlock came on, if I realized he was here, relax your hands, if I realized the attack was coming, I would tuck my chin. I'm gonna assume right now that I don't have that time. I'm totally surprised, and this happens to me. From here, my hands are gonna to wanna to go where they feel pain. I make my hands like hooks, I pluck explosively. I reach as far back as I can. Not right to here, farther, so I get momentum, and I pluck. I reach for both his hands, because this is where there's an opening. There's no help for me here. This is where he's the weakest. Both hands go like hooks, as far back as I can, and I pluck down, explosively. As I'm plucking, if I have not already turned my chin, I pluck and turn my chin. Adding to that, my hands go and pluck, my chin turns, my shoulder drives into him. My hips are gonna drive out a little bit. I focus a lot on my shoulder, turning in. I am interested in making this space right here, that space. I wanna take the headlock, hold stronger, from here to there. At the same time, chin turn, shoulder drive. Now there's enough space, I slide my head out. Stepping out to get some balance, knees to the midsection, knees to the groin, Kicks to the groin. If it's available to me, knee to the head, knee to the face. Finishing, finishing, with whatever technique seem appropriate. The danger in this attack is my throat being crushed. It's not quite a carotid, it's not quite a blood choke. It's my windpipe. I have to address the danger immediately. Here, and then I'm sliding out. One common problem about this angle. When I make the defense, as I said, this shoulder, the inside shoulder, drives in toward the attacker. What I'm not doing is taking the outside shoulder away. Watch, if Andrew chokes even a little bit stronger, and I try and take the outside shoulder away, I take myself into the choke, I hang myself. Instead, I pluck, and the inside shoulder goes into him to help create space. 
From here, I'm sliding my head out, stepping, and finishing. Good, headlock from behind, bar arm. Okay, so let's break down this technique for a minute. What is happening when the headlock comes on, most often I will be pulled back a little bit, so I like to do all my training being a little bit off balance. If you're on balance, great, but let's train as though you've been pulled back aggressively. The headlock is coming behind me. My hands are like hooks. My thumbs are part of the hook. I reach back as far back as I can, not right to where the hands are, farther to build momentum and to ensure that I catch his hands. Both hands fly back and pluck down explosively. This is the action of the hands, this motion. I reach as far back and I rip down, plucking, not grabbing. As my hands make the pluck, my chin is turning, if it hasn't already turned. So my hands go back and I'm turning my chin. And if you watch, the motion of sending my hands back and turning my chin already encourages my shoulder to turn in. I want that. Now I make that happen explosively. Hands go, chin turns, and my shoulder drives into him. My legs are working. I'm pivoting on, one, on my outside foot. My hips are going to turn in, and they're going to bend a little bit to make this action. My whole goal is to create a little bit of space between his headlock and my throat. Once I have that space, as long as my chin has turned, I'll be able to slide out. If I keep my chin out, it may get caught. This is what I want. Hands like hooks. Sharp turn. Once I slide my head out, I'm catching, and I'm finishing with combatives. Headlock from behind, now a carotid choke. The, the attack is very similar. The defense is very similar with some changes. The attack comes on, and now instead of this bar arm we discussed earlier, where the pressure's on my throat, the attacker grabs deeper. My throat is in the crook of his, of his, el of his elbow. The pressure comes from the sides now. For me, the main change is the weak part of his attack is farther away from me. My hands have to reach farther. When I reach as far as I can, I still reach for his hands and I pluck and make almost the exact same defense. All the basics are the same as the, the bar arm. Two differences. On the bar arm, because the weak part, the, the, the joint I'm looking for, is so close to me, my hands tend to reach at about the same time. No problem here. By the way, on this defense, if they reached one, two, it might be OK. But because the, the weak part of this hold is so close, they tend to go at the same time. When I'm defending against the carotid version of this attack, I'm going to let the close hand go a little bit sooner. I'm not delaying this hand. This hand goes as fast as it can, but this hand will arrive sooner because it's closer. So the rhythm you create with your pluck tends to be a little bit more of one, one and a half. The reason for this is that if I send both hands simultaneously, both hands will tend to reach only as far as the short hand can go. And that Make the joke deeper. That may limit my reach. So I'm always sending the near hand freer. As soon as it can go, as fast and as far as it can go, letting the other hand follow up to make a defense. Now, this hand should get there as soon as possible. It's not one, stop, two. It's as soon as possible, but you will hear a small rhythm of one hand reaching and the other hand following up this way. The other variation in my defense is this. In a bar arm attack, the pressure's here, the hold is closer. I tend to pluck straight down along my chest. In this carotid version of the attack, I tend to pluck more along 
my shoulder. You can think of this as a difference if you'd like to. It is a difference in, in my body position, one down the chest, the other down my shoulder. But the truth is, as far as physics go, it's the same. Because what I'm doing against the bar arm is plucking 90 degrees to the hold. What I'm doing against the carotid is exactly the same, plucking 90 degrees to the hold. So even though it's a different part of my body, in principle, it's the exact same technique. Everything else after that is the same. Sliding my head out, finishing with counterattacks, neutralizing the threat. The breakdown for this defense against a carotid headlock from behind is very similar to the bar arm. My hands go back like hooks. The thumb is always part of the hook. I reach as far back as I can, and I pluck down. The only difference is I have to be sure to reach as far back as I can, because the, the weak part of his hold is much farther behind me, possibly well over my shoulder. So I reach as far back as I can, and the rhythm becomes more like one, one and a half. One hand goes, the other hand follows up. At the same time that I'm making that pluck, I'm fighting to turn my chin. Keep in mind that he's got a forearm on one side of your neck and a bicep on the other. So the turning of your chin might not happen until you've begun to make this pluck, but you're still fighting to turn your chin the whole time. Reach as far back as you can, pluck explosively, turn your chin. As those two things are happening, you're driving your shoulder just like the other technique into him as much as you can. Trying to create that space between your, his arm and his body here so I can slide my head out. Hands like hooks, reach as far back as I can, turn the chin and drive the shoulder here. From here I'm sliding out, catching and finishing with knees, kicks, elbows, whatever combatives seem appropriate in the moment. The defense we've shown so far has been against uh, a bar arm headlock from behind and a carotid headlock from behind. There's one more that we're going to teach to you how to make the attack and then also how to defend it. This is what you'll call a sleeper hold, rear naked choke in some systems. The idea now is I'm going to make the same kind of carotid attack uh, on Andrew, but instead of just catching him here, I'm going to make it a full choke where I slide my hand around. I get his throat to the crook of my elbow, but now I lock the hold up. I reach my hand around and I catch my own bicep. The free hand goes to the back of his head, and again, his throat should be in the crook of my elbow. From here, I want to make pressure inward on the sides. So like I want to take my hand, this hand, to the opposite shoulder, I squeeze inward like scissors. I've puffed my chest, and Andrew should feel pressure on the sides. What this does is cut off the blood supply to his brain. It's not really a choke. I'm not stopping air from getting to his brain or into his lungs. I'm stopping blood from going up into his brain. So I slide my hand around deep. I want to get his throat in the crook of my elbow. As I'm doing that, I reach around. I catch my own bicep. My hand comes to the back of his head to hide as best I can, and I squeeze. Now, to make pressure, as I'm squeezing inward this way, I can also take my chest and puff it out. So I'm doing this, and he feels pressure. This is the, the, the sleeper hold, rear naked choke, blood choke. It's got a number of names, but it's designed to put him out, put him to sleep, by denying uh, blood to his brain. So now I want to talk about a defense, or a possible defense, against this rear naked choke, this fully sealed rear naked choke. But before I do, I want to give some caveats. Because if you'll notice, we showed a defense against the bar arm. 
We showed a defense against the other version of carotid. We are going to talk about a defense against this particular attack, but it's very difficult to pull off. The truth is, by the time you let the attacker, the person in my position, get this deep in their choke and seal their hands, if you haven't reacted before this by either defending with a pluck or at least tucking your chin, you have big trouble. It's almost like asking, if you don't defend until this stage of the attack, it's almost like asking if Andrew's back is to me like this, and I sneak up behind him with a two by four and beat him over the head with it, it's like asking what's the stick defense against that attack. The truth is, your defense was a little bit of awareness, being aware of somebody coming behind you so you could turn and defend that stick. Just like here, a little bit of awareness. If, as I'm trying to make this full-on carotid, Andrew tucks his chin now, he's made it hard for me. Now he can function. But I do want to at least give you something to try. If you are late, distracted, for whatever reason, you don't defend until this rear naked choke is fully on. I'm going to give you a couple of options. Understand that none of them may work. You are late and you are in trouble. All of these may fail. But you should try and do something, otherwise you're just out. So when the lock comes on, if you have anything you can access, depending on your type of work, maybe you're military or law enforcement, you might have an edged weapon you can access, you should be stabbing with the edged weapon, stabbing with the weapon to deal with them this way. Even if you're a civilian, if you have a pen in your pocket, your keys, try and stab, try and jab, try and hurt him enough that maybe he, he is discouraged and holding on. If you have no weapons available and all you have are your hands, a technique you can try, a little stronger, Andrew, is this. What I'm going to do is reach back and scramble and claw for that hand that's behind me and peel it off. Once it's off, I can make the exact same pluck that we made before. The trick, though, is to try and find that hand that's behind your head, scratch, claw for it, get fingers if you can, and tear it off. Look what I'm, look what I'm catching. Once it's off, I have a chance to make that pluck. Here's why I gave the caveat earlier. If this attacker is at all decent at making this attack, by the time you are finding his hand and trying to defend, then you're probably going out. I want to give you some tools to use, something to try if you find yourself caught here and can't do anything else. But understand that you should not think of this as a great solution. This is a thing to try if all else has failed and you did not defend in time. Reach back, scratch and claw to loosen that hand, make the pluck. But again, if this attacker understands what he's doing, you're probably going out by that point. Your defense really was to tuck your chin earlier or make the pluck at his hands before he got the hold fully in place. It's important in any training to not only discuss, but train in preemptive striking. The truth is you should never wait to be attacked. If, even if I know a good defense against a headlock or defense against a choke, I'm not going to wait till the hands are on my throat and then show what I know. I want to be away from that attack before it happens, or I want to be solving that problem before the attack comes on me. So any good training methodology should, methodology should include preemptive strikes. We're going to work on a couple of drills today. I want to give credit where credit is due. The drill I'm going to show you is one of my favorites. It was created by a gentleman named Jeff Jimmo, an excellent fight and self-defense trainer, trains mixed martial arts fighters, was a bouncer for years. Good guy. If you get a chance to train with him, train with him. This drill is an excellent drill, and it comes from him. The idea is I want to train in advance to know where my line is drawn. I want to decide before any event that somebody does a certain thing, I'm going to punch them first. Because in a situation, there's all the talk beforehand, which you may or may not be able to manage well. There's the fight itself, which you react to. That's what Krav Maga is for. You get choked, you're defending aggressively. But there is that middle ground 
when you're not sure whether or not a fight is going to happen and you feel uncertainty, butterflies in your stomach. We want to help you solve that problem. We want to give you decisions to make in advance. This is going to be one suggestion. You'll ultimately come up with your own line in the sand, but I encourage you to find that line. Whatever it is for you, you find it. The drill is going to be this. An attacker, somebody threatening me, is outside of my range. A range where I'm a little more comfortable, I don't feel like they can hurt me. I'm going to take what I'll call a modified fighting stance. Again, not looking like I'm ready to fight, but I'm in a position to defend myself if need be. My hands are up a little more open, more like I'm holding him off. Now I'm going to take one of my hands and have it a little bit more forward. This is like my antenna. And here's the rule I'm going to encourage you to follow. It's only an example. You can adjust this drill on your own. But what I'm going to do is this. Hold the pad a little bit farther back. And what I'm going to say is this. If I've told this guy to leave me alone, back off, don't come any closer. And my rule personally is if I've told him that, and he comes in closer and touches my forward hand with his body, boom, I'm hitting. That's my rule. That's what I make for myself. If I feel like this is a confrontation in any way, and I've told this guy, back off, stay back, I don't like what you're doing, boom, I hit. If he touches my forward hand, I hit. Now again, you can modify this rule. Maybe in your own mind, you've decided, you know, your line in the sand is two touches. Maybe the guy comes in one time, look, back off, I don't want any trouble, and whoom, the second time you hit. Fair enough. Maybe for you it's three times. For me, it's one. If I've told somebody one time to back off and stay away, that's my warning. If he comes in on that, I'm hitting. Now look, I'm not shoving him and then hitting. This is like a trigger. It's my radar, my antenna. The minute he touches it, boom, I'm hitting him. How I hit is worth talking about. If you're only familiar with a straight punch in Krav Maga, then you make a straight punch. Andrew, hold the pad about shoulder level. Andrew holds the pad straight ahead, and as he comes forward, I throw a straight punch. Fine. What I prefer, if you know it, if this tool's in your toolbox, instead of hitting straight on, I'm going to give a big, wide hook punch. Not super wide, but he comes in, and I'm hitting with more of a hook punch. Using Andrew's face, I don't really want to hit here. It'll cause damage. It's not bad. But if I can, if I have a preference and a choice, I want to hit the side of the jaw. This long target right here that is better for knocking him out. So when your partner holds, if you're going to train on this drill, have your partner hold the pad back at about shoulder level, turn slightly, slightly inward, and you're working on a hook punch. A long hook punch, so it's not this tight one in here that's kind of standard for fighting. I'm opening up a little bit. That's the punch I want, hitting the side of the jaw to knock somebody out. My last comment to you is this. You want to train this technique realistically. So if you watch, I'm actually sacrificing a little bit of my power and then trying to build it back up through training. What I'm not doing in the technique is winding up or loading way back and then throwing my strongest hook. Because by the time I've loaded up here, he can be hitting me. My hands are up in this kind of leave me alone, back off position. I'm going to throw the punch from here. So the minute he comes forward, I'm just punching. I'm here. And I punch without loading up first. I don't want to take that time. I learn to build power just from this short range punch. The idea, of course, would be to hit there, the side of the jaw. Again, the techniques are simple. Hands up, modified fighting stance, short, strong hook punch. The situation is what you're training for. You're going to decide in your own mind when you are willing to throw a preemptive strike. Of course, the context is, this guy means business. I sense trouble. He's telling me things. He's threatening me. He's assaulting me, essentially. And I feel like I'm in danger. I decide already that if he comes any closer, I'm going to hit him. And before the situation happened, before I went to this bar, before I knew this guy, a year in advance, I've trained. I've decided that's my line in the sand. I tell somebody to stay off. If they come forward, boom, I'm hitting them. You may decide it's two touches. Look, back off. I don't want any trouble. Boom and then I hit. But whatever you decide is your own line in the sand, decide it, make it, know it in advance so that when you're ever in the situation, you don't wait to be attacked, you attack first. You make yourself safe right away. Good. That's one example of preemptive striking.
guillotine choke. Maybe it begins because I took a kick to the groin and I got doubled over. Or maybe I shoot in to try and catch James with a takedown of some kind, and he defends, and I expose my neck, and I get caught in a guillotine. Feel that? From here, my neck is being choked. I have to find ways to defend. We're actually going to separate our bodies a little more than we might do in a real technique, so you guys can see on, on video, and you can hear me talk. So the guillotine would probably be deeper than this, but we're out here so you can see some of the actions of my hand. When I'm in the hold, the outside hand comes across and plucks. Thumb is part of the hook, just like you've learned in other techniques. I pluck explosively. At the same time that I'm plucking, I'm going to tuck my chin to my shoulder. This. I am doing this action to protect my neck as much as possible. Pluck, turn your chin. This should be familiar from headlock from behind. At the same time that I'm plucking and turning my chin, my free hand is striking to the groin. As soon as I make that groin strike and I create any space, I want to take that shoulder and wedge it in. I want the shoulder wedged in in case I fail in the rest of the technique. Watch what happens. So James, after I make the technique, try and reacquire the choke. Go ahead. Once my shoulder's wedged in, it's very hard for James to reacquire the choke. That's why the shoulder has to be in. So I'm plucking and turning my chin, striking to the groin, wedging that shoulder into the hole so he can't reacquire. Now from here, I want to change our situation. You are back now. If you watch what I'm doing, as soon as I feel like I've softened him up, I use my legs. I drive a little bit forward, a lot up in the air. I'm doing this. I'm not using shoulder, although shoulder helps. It's legs, it's hips. I'm driving a little bit forward, a lot up. To break the hold. From here, spinning, punching, Knees, groin kicks, basic combatives to neutralize him. Again, the whole technique. Good. The only comment. You should really measure any self-defense system by how well it works if it doesn't work completely, how much it helps you if the entire technique isn't successful. In this technique, I should turn your back. It may be that you get to hear, but you're much smaller than your attacker, or they're much stronger than you, or they realize what's going on. And from here, it may be that you don't have the power, or you haven't hurt them enough to break this hold. OK. At the very least, You've defended the choke, the immediate danger is gone, and you have plenty of opportunity to groin strike. If you can't get free, if you can't get free from here, continue with knees. If I can't break that hold, I have opportunities for counterattacks. I prefer to get out of that hold with a spin, but I, if I can't, I'm counterattacking. One more time. Defense against the guillotine choke.
headlock from the side. By the time I realize I'm being attacked at all, I'm about here. There's no way to resist the attack. I have to go with it. As I'm falling forward, if I can, I'm taking my outside foot and stepping around. We'll discuss what to do if you can't step around in a minute. But for now, we'll assume that you have a little bit of time or ability to step around. As I'm stepping, not after, as I'm stepping, outside hand strikes to the groin, inside hand comes between my head and my attackers. Instinctively, as you fall forward, your hands are going to want to move somewhere. We use that, and instead of my hands flying to break my fall, we do this. The attack comes here. In addition, I want to protect myself against the most immediate dangers. I'm worried about James either cranking my neck or possibly choking me or punching me in the face. So as I'm stepping around and as I'm striking, I also tuck my chin. You may find in this video that my chin is up a little bit so you can hear what I'm saying, but very much tuck your chin inside the technique. From here, this hand that's between my head and my attackers catches the face. Thumb is tucked away under the chin. The real work's done by your index finger to the nose and fingers in the eyes. All of this is aggressive and strong. From here, I lift his chin up. This is the most important thing about the technique. Get the chin up. From here, rotate a little bit. As soon as his chin is up, I drop my elbow straight down, straight down as I stand up. And from here, hammer fist to the face or throat, punches, if appropriate, kicks to the head, stomp to neutralize him. Again, the attack comes on, falling in, tucking my chin, striking to the groin, and my hand goes between my head and my attackers, catching the face, index finger to the nose, fingers in the eyes, lift the chin, drop your elbows straight down, hammer fist, punches. A couple of comments about this angle, James. When you make the defense, it's very important you get the chin up. Common mistake is for students to grab the face and push that direction, push back. I want to give you a quick demonstration. James, relax. Just stand, facing this way. Make your neck strong. Don't let me move you. Don't let me move you. From here, I catch on the forehead instead. Don't let me move your head back. I can't do it. In fact, you know what? Walk forward. Walk, walk. I can't stop him. Come back. Walk forward. I can't stop him. Good. Walk forward. You feel the difference, yes? Yes. Leverage on the pain and leverage on the chin. So the attack comes in. I am not trying to push back on his head. I'm trying to lift the chin up. That's what you want. Then, rotate. The minute the chin is up, you take your, stay where you are. You take your elbow straight down. Think about taking your elbow to your hip. Another verbal cue, think about taking his head and putting it in your back pocket. All those will work. But the idea is chin up, then you drop straight down. From here, I am counterattacking. Hammer fist to the face or throat. If the angle's better, straight punches, kicks, any attacks that seem appropriate to you. Last comment. Watch the footwork. I step in if I can, lift his chin up, take my elbow down. Now, look where my foot is. It might be in the way. If I feel like he's going to fall on me, Watch my back foot. All I do is step out with it a little bit. It helps give me more leverage on him and keeps him from landing on top of me. Headlock from the side. All right, so as we've discussed, a basic version of the technique involves the defender stepping around. So when James attacks, if I can, I want to step my foot, this forward foot, around to help stabilize me. But once you have the technique down, you want to start uh, training for more difficult situations. So it may be that James steps this foot farther across, or maybe I'm very unprepared. So by the time I defend, I can't really step. I can still make the technique. The technique still works well. It's a little more difficult. It maybe takes a grab strong. Yeah, because I'm here. But I can still make the technique as long as I get his chin up and take his head down immediately. So even though I recommend for beginners that you train with this step, once you have a basic understanding of the technique, start making little modifications in the attack. Step deeper. If I'm going to attack James, maybe I step deeper and make it hard for him to step around. 
The technique still works. You may feel a little more resistance, but the technique works very well. I just recommend you start with a basic version before going to something more advanced. Headlock from the side rolling in. Now this attack begins exactly the same way as a regular headlock technique. The attack comes on, and about here, I still don't know what's happening. So at the beginning of the technique, my defense has to be the same. I'm tucking my chin, my hands flying toward his groin, my other hand starting to come up to make its defense. But about this point, things start changing. Instead of being held in the standard headlock, I'm being pulled in and down. Like James wants to take me to the floor. I have to use my initial technique, but alter it. Instead of this, I'm pulled in here. Now, it's hard for us to stop in the middle. We can't freeze our bodies in free fall. So I'm going to do one thing that you should not do in the technique. And I'm going to take my outside knee. I'm actually going to put it on the ground so I can talk about my position. The truth is, in the technique, you should see my knee about here as my body starts to go. The attack is made, I tuck in close. My hand was, was going to strike to his groin, now reaches deep. So my shoulder and body come as close to him as possible. I don't want to have space between us. He will then fall on top of me. I want to be close. This hand that was going to go to the face catches his body, maybe it catches his shoulder, it catches something, and it pulls. I'm essentially low bridging him. Again, hard to do slow, we'll go as slow as we can. The attack comes on. Here, that's the initial movement. It's not the complete movement, that's the initial part. Watch how close to his body I get to low bridge him. The farther I am, come back up James. The farther I am from James, this is a negative demonstration. The farther I am from James, the more I simply pull him on top of me and feel his weight. This is not the idea of the technique. I get close to him, so as he rolls, he rolls over the top of me, and I feel little or none of his weight. Come back. Now, the last part. I want to stay close. I want to finish him. I'm not throwing him away. As he rolls, I also roll. And if I look what I'm doing. One hand reaches out. I base out. My hips go back a little bit. What I don't want to happen, James, keep the headlock on. What I don't want is to roll him and then him continue to roll me over. So as soon as I rolled over, I'm basing out. From here, if he already has already let go of me, striking, striking, striking to finish him. If for some reason he's still holding on, hold strong, scratching and clawing at the face, cross face, my forearm against his jawline, my shoulders and legs do the work. He calls him to let go. You feel this, James? Yeah. And then I'm finishing. One more time. Headlock from the side, rolling in.
they're totally different paradigms. Now, some of them translate. You can cross over between being a mixed martial arts fighter and a self-defense practitioner. Certainly some things that you do in mixed martial arts work on the street, some don't. The main thing to keep in mind is that when you're training for a mixed martial arts fight, it's a totally different paradigm. You're training against somebody you know, you know how much he weighs, you know how much he's supposed to weigh, <laughs> you, you, know, you know what his style is, what his experience is, you've watched a video of him probably, and you get to prepare. You have two to three months to prepare for that fight. It's different, you, you get to work on a certain set of skills. You know the day and the time of your fight. If you know the day and the time of your fight, you can prepare for it. Krav Maga takes a different approach. You might not be attacked tomorrow, it might be a year from now, it might be two from now. It might be the day after you learn how to defend yourself. It might be a year after you stop training. The approach for Krav Maga is overall preparedness against any kind of attack. In a mixed martial arts fight, it's stand up, it's ground fighting. There are rules. On the street, there are no rules. There are no rules, no rules for the other guy. There are no rules for you. So even one of the techniques we'll work on for this video, you'll see I'll talk about the difference between the things you have to do as a mixed martial art fighter and the things you can do on the street, including eye gouging and biting and, and techniques that are not allowed in the ring. Again. Good. Good. Slowly now. Good. Bear it from the front, arms are caught. We're actually going to make an assumption now that we don't normally make in Krav Maga techniques, and then we're going to take that assumption away in a minute. But for right now, we're going to imagine that Nikki reacts a little bit early. She has a little bit of time before Andrew has the bear hug completely on and his hips are totally close to be able to control her body. So Andrew slowly begins the attack and Nikki first spaces and bases. Because she drops her weight down into a fighting stance, her hands are forward, palms are against the, his hip pointers, the front of his hips. Her elbows, dig your elbows a little tighter, elbows are in tight. This keeps Andrew's hips away from her, which is what she wants. This prevents him from getting complete control of her body. Immediately off of this position, Nikki throws a knee. Okay, maybe she follows up with one or two more knees, freeze, and exactly right. From here, rotate counterclockwise, rotate this way, keep rotating this way, good. What you want is that inside arm up and against the body. So go back and make the technique again from the beginning, slowly. Space and base, good. She stabilizes and gives a knee. Now the inside arm comes up, push away a little more. Yeah, that's what you want here, to keep him off. From here, she finishes with more knees. Disengages when she's neutralized him and makes space. Again. Good. The reason Nikki wants Andrew's hips away is that if Andrew is allowed to get his hips in close, get a full bear hug, the closer his hips are, the more easily he can lift her and dump her. She doesn't want that. So if she, relax, if she has time early in the technique to react, she spaces and bases and holds him, his hips away, disallowing some of his control. Okay, one more time live. Good. Now, next technique. It's still a bear hug from the front, but now we're going to assume that there's no space. So by the time, don't defend, make the attack please. By the time Nikki reacts, Andrew's already on top. Relax for a second. We need to talk about assumptions and reality here. If this is really the case, if Nikki had no idea an attack was coming and Andrew gets that close to her and Andrew knew his intentions, he was going to pick her up, he's going to dump her, then the truth is Nikki's probably on the ground at that point. And that's why we have to train in ground fighting as well. And we will in Krav Maga. But we're going to assume another thing, that maybe Andrew isn't totally prepared for his takedown technique. Maybe he's going to readjust his grip. Maybe he's not sure what he's going to do. So in that fraction of a second when Andrew succeeds in getting all the way in with his hips close, Nikki Freeze, right here, has a split second to react. That's our context. Back up, make the attack, and make the defense live. Good, again. Good, make the attack and freeze, please, slowly. Good. Now here's the problem. Nikki needs to find some way to establish this base 
and create distance between her hips and Andrew's hips so she can finish the technique. She's going to shift her own hips and strike to the groin, hopefully causing this reaction. From here, she spaces and bases, just like before. And from this moment on, the technique is exactly the same. So you do the whole thing slowly, please. Good. So this technique, bearing from the front, arms caught, has two small variations. Either Nikki reacts a little bit early and stops Andrew's hips from ever getting close to her, and she's giving a knee and finishing from here. Or if she reacts later, she has no space. She creates it by shifting her hips and striking to the groin. Good. And finishing. Good. Barrack from the front, arms caught. Now we do barrack from behind. And we start with the same idea of barrack from behind, arms caught. Andrew comes in and makes the attack, and they make the defense aggressive. Good. Again, one more time. Good. Even though it's now from behind, you see, you'll see Nikki following the exact same principles. As, not yet, as she's attacked, you're going to see her space and base and try and, and, and make herself hard to pick up. The lower her center of gravity, the harder she becomes to pick up. But it's going to be a little more than that. So Andrew, make the attack. Nikki, make the space and base. But watch what's happened. Not only has she shifted her feet and lowered her center of gravity, she's also shifted her body forward slightly. If she were to, to lower her center of gravity, but keep everything upright, make your body a little bit taller, all Andrew would have to do is drop his own body a little bit lower, take your arms lower, and he could pick her up again. But, relax, go back. Because Nikki also drops her weight slightly forward, grab, it's as though, she, well, it is like she takes her center of gravity away from him. Now, because her weight is farther from his hips, she's harder to pick up. If the attacker, relax you guys, if the attacker can lift whatever weight away from his body, if he can lift 200 pounds away from his body, he's going to pick you up no matter what. But shifting your weight forward slightly and dropping your center of gravity makes you at least harder to pick up. From here, after spacing and basing, make the attack, make the spacing base. Good. Nikki needs to find ways to counterattack. She's going to feel which side is closest to her. She's going to shift her hips and make groin strikes. Good. Shaking her body, making herself hard to hold on to, giving elbows, turning, and finishing. Good. Go back. There's no guarantee that the attacker, make the attack slowly. Let's go. Don't let go on the first one. Nikki may have to strike several times, twist her body to become hard to hold on to. Nice. Excellent. Now, this groin strike is going to become the, the simplest and most effective technique you have, but not the only technique. Nikki can also stomp the foot. She can do an uppercut back kick to strike his groin. These are also viable options. Add a few more counterattacks, Nikki. Good. Nice. Good. The upside of stomping the foot and uppercut back kick are that they give you more tools in your toolbox. The downside of these techniques is that they shift your weight. Your feet are already doing a job. They're trying to keep uh, balance, trying to fight back against his hold. Adding uppercut back kicks and stomps are good, but they destabilize you a little bit. So I consider them secondary options. Your first option should always be that groin strike. It is fast, simple, effective, and it does not um, ruin the integrity of your, of your stance. One more time slowly. Now, bear hug from behind, but now the arms are free. Live. Good. Nice. Nikki, do it again. This time, bigger turn. Turn He's tucking his head. He's safe. Bigger turn. Give two strong elbows. Good. Nice. Nice. Now slowly. Do it again slowly. This time, give two elbows, one side, then the other, alternating. Then do whatever you want. Give those first two elbows. Yes. Good. If you watch, just like all the bear hugs we worked on, Nikki begins with that same space and base action. Andrew comes in to grab slowly now. Comes in to grab. Nikki spaces and bases. From here, her arms are free, so she's going to throw two elbows, two very sharp and aggressive elbows, one on either side. This is one of the few times, relax for a second, 
one of the few times in Krav Maga that we're going to tell you more than one counterattack. Normally in Krav Maga, we insist on the first counterattack, and then we recommend options after that. There are logical steps after that, and we usually talk about them. But the only thing we generally require is that first logical counterattack. This is one of the few times in the system where we give you the first two counterattacks. And the reason is this. Andrew, I actually want you to do it facing the camera. So face the camera, Nikki. And Andrew, this time, leave your head up. Nikki, go a little slower. When Andrew comes in, Nikki drops her weight from here. She throws one elbow, now freeze. Now this first elbow, either it lands and Andrew's head gets knocked to one side so Nikki can throw the other elbow, good, and she connects with both, or after that first elbow, as it's happening, Andrew takes his head away from it to avoid it and he's open for the second one. So we want you dropping your weight, always throwing those two elbows. After those two, Nikki continues with counterattacks turns and finishes. Good, one more time slowly. Good, one last comment about this technique. We've talked several times about the idea of spacing and basing, about your weight not only dropping down, but also dropping forward. Watch what happens in slow motion. Andrew, put your head to whatever spot you expect it to go. And Nikki, don't drop your weight forward, right? So make a little bit of an error in the technique. Andrew, make the attack slowly. Okay, look where Andrew's head is. Look where it is relative to Nikki's back. If Nikki doesn't drop her weight, when she tries to throw elbows, she ends up connecting with the tricep, or not connecting at all. Because maybe Andrew is trying to tuck his head against her back. Now, same thing, relax. Same attack, Andrew. Nikki, do the same thing, but now drop your weight slightly forward. If you watch what happens, by, ah, by dropping her body forward, Nikki's exposed Andrew's head a little bit more, gives her a better chance of landing one or both of these elbows. That's the idea. Not only is this dropping of the weight um, better for you in terms of maintaining stability, it also helps expose the attacker's head for your elbows. Last time, full speed. Bear hug from behind, arms free. Bear hug from the front, arms free, assuming that I have a little space to operate. The attack comes in, and if you look, my reaction is exactly the same as bear hug from the front, arms caught. If Andrew were to make the same attack with my arms caught, this is the defense. He makes the attack with my arms free, and I have a little bit of time to react. I'm attempting the exact same technique. Spacing and basing. My hands are on the outside of his now, but I'm trying to stop his hips from coming close. And once I stabilize this position, knee to the groin, another knee, come up and catch and hold, Continue with counterattacks. It's a very simple technique, exactly the same as bear hug from the front, arms caught. There's one big assumption here that I'm able to get my arms around his arms to his hips. Andrew and I are roughly the same size, I'm able to do so. Put a smaller defender in my place, give somebody, Andrew's pretty strong, but somebody with much bigger arms than Andrew. And it may be hard for that person to get their hands around. So we like this technique as a, as a starting point, as a basic reaction against a bear hug from the front, arms free. Change angle. But now we're going to make an assumption. Maybe I can't stop his hips from coming close. Maybe I'm later in the attack. So by the time I realize I should defend, or I'm able to do anything, Andrew's already in close, his hips are in close this way, and I can't make that same reaction. I can't stop his hips, they're already here. That's now my assumption. We're going to do it with your back to the camera. Make the attack. Good. Good. Let's go back to this angle. Now again, we made this statement in a previous technique, we have to admit something. That if he knows what he's doing, and he has intentions to pick me up or take me down, and if I'm this late in my reaction, that I don't do anything until here, I'm probably on the ground. 
But again, there are times and moments when maybe he hesitates, maybe he readjusts his grip or his stance before dumping me, and I have a second to react. I want to do something. I reach around. I may even try to hold strong. I may even try to space and base a little bit. Reach around, catch his face. I'm going to show you some variations, but we start with this. Catching the face. Use the bridge of his nose as a handle. Fingers go in the eyes, and I peel his chin away. His head should roll along my chest like I'm opening a jar. Here. Change the angle. Right here. Catch. Roll his chin away. I'm not sliding his head along my chest. I'm rolling his chin away. You feel the leverage, Andrew? Yeah. And from here, I continue to roll. Change the angle again. Watch my foot. This foot over here. As I roll him, I step out. Drop to one knee if you want to. To finish him. This angle again. So you saw what's happening with the hands on one side. Now watch the finishing position on the other side. From here, catch, roll his chin away, stepping out. From here. I want to talk about some variations of, of this attack. This is bear hug from the front, arms free. Now if we were going to compare our reaction, let's say, to the training of a mixed martial arts fighter. When Andrew comes in and makes the, the bear hug, from here, if I'm addressing this like a mixed martial arts fight, one of the techniques you might apply in that kind of situation for sport would be to swim in. Take my hand and slide in and go from his hands down here, which in mixed martial arts fighting you would call underhooks. Sliding in this way, I slide my other hand in and I maybe go to get underhooks on him. In the sport arena, it's a very viable and it's a good technique to apply. But think about it, in sport fighting, there are rules. If there are rules, Maybe I have to do this. Maybe it's my best option. On the street, for me, there are no rules. My hands are free. Instead of swimming in this way to get underhooks, I come around and I grab his face. Not allowed in a sport fight. Allowed on the street. Here, roll his chin away. So there's some advantage to having my hands up. Now I want to talk about variations. This idea of reaching around, one more time, Andrew, of reaching around and catching the bridge of the nose is excellent, but it's not the only option. It's a principle you want to follow more than a technique. So the principle is leverage on the neck. The technique I'm showing is reaching around, catching the bridge of his nose. But the principle is more important. Principle is leverage on the neck. So let's say Andrew buries his head a lot more, a lot more. I can't reach around and find. Take this hand, use the webbing between the thumb and index finger, drive in and up, lift his chin up. Again, the principle is leverage on the neck. Headbutt, elbow, catch and finish. The principle is more important than the technique. He buries his head. I can't find him this way. I find him this way. Turn your head to the inside. Good. Let's say I can't find him either way. Thumbs in his eyes, lifting his chin. <laughs> Again, the idea is leverage on the neck. If Anna were to take his head, single, head on this side, but turn your face inward, all the way, all the way inward. If his head's over here, look, I reach the other way, and I catch him. Or I catch him here. Back to this angle. If I need to, let's say I can't quite get enough leverage. I get here, but I need help. I use the other hand, and I push away. The point is, following a specific technique is not vital. Staying safe is vital. Following principles will help you. So even though you may start your training with this clean, simple version of the technique, good, once you have some basic understanding, start modifying how you catch. Thumbs in his eyes. Webbing between your index finger and thumb, under his nose here. Lifting his chin, finishing. It's all the same principle. In the end, all the same reaction. Just a little bit different specifics. Bear hug from the front, arms free. Here, here. Here.
Go, 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 go,